Welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started um, just so we can use the full hour today. Welcome to our event today on Moving Past the Binary, the Importance of Transgender and Non-Binary Inclusion in Gender Equity Research. My name is Anisha Cindy, and I am a research manager here at the Women in Public Policy Program at Harvard Kennedy School. Before we begin, um, we want to offer a land acknowledgement to honor the land on which Harvard University sits, which is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary unceded homeland of the Massachusetts people, the surviving descendants of the first people of Massachusetts, of, and of the Neponset Band of the Massachusetts. We are thrilled here at WAP today to spotlight some amazing researchers and academics in honor of Transgender Day of Visibility, which is dedicated to celebrating the transgender community and raising awareness of the work that is still needed to be done for trans justice. I'll begin by introducing each of our panelists and then hand it over to them for a facilitated conversation for about 45 minutes. And then we will do a 15 minute Q&A at the end Please use the Q&A function, which should be in the, the sidebar below, um, to ask any questions for the panel throughout the panel, and we will address them um, during that 15-minute Q&A at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, our really great panelists today. We're excited to welcome Aviva Arun Choudhury, who is a cultural anthropologist whose work focuses on gender, race, sexuality, and class in the United States. Their research and teaching focuses on the circula circulation and institutionalization of racialized and gendered categories and logics in US-based institutions, primarily nonprofit and funding organizations. These writings spans academic scholarship, organizational training materials, and public scholarship, and they are the prim primary author of Transforming Inclusion, an Organizational Guide, which was published as a resource for organizations, foundations, feminist and LGBTQ advocacy organizations to better include, support, affirm, and affirm transgender and gender nonconforming people. Thank you, V, for joining us today. Uh, next, we have Dr. A.J. Loic, who is the Gender Equity Advisor at the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity in Vancouver, British Columbia. They are a trans scholar and trans health researcher, having earned their PhD from the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Loic is a renowned expert on trans and gender inclusion, working with researchers, healthcare and social service organizations, lawyers and policymakers who are interested in ensuring that their research design and analysis, policies, practices and legal reform activities are inclusive to those people who are marginalized and minoritized based on their gender, sexes and sexualities. Thank you, Dr. Loic, for joining us today. Dr. Sabra Katz-Wise is an assistant professor in adolescent and young adult medicine at Boston Children's Hospital in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and in social and behavioral sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She also co-directs the Harvard SOGI Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity and Expression Health Equity Research Collaborative and is a senior faculty advisor for the BCH Office of Health Equity and Inclusion. Dr. Katzweiss's research investigates sexual orientation and gender identity development, sexual fluidity, and health inequities related to sexual orientation, as well as gender identity in adolescents and young adults. Thank you, Dr. Katzweiss, for joining us today. Um, Mia Miyagi is a graduate student in the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, as well as a member of the Gender Sci Lab at Harvard. The Gender Sci Lab is a collaborative interdisciplinary lab dedicated to generating feminist concepts, methods, and theories for scientific research on sex and gender. Mia is interested in how sex is conceptualized in the context of evolutionary biology, as well as how rhetoric about science is used in discussions surrounding transgender rights. Thank you, Mia, for joining us today. Um, and finally, our moderator for today is Dr. Sari Van Anders, um, and she is the Canada 150 Research Chair in Social Neuroendocrinology, Sexuality and Gender and Sex, and the Professor of Psychology, Gender Studies, and Neuroscience, and Neuroscience at Queen's University. Um, Dr. Van Anders has published over 90 papers with research that sets out new ways to conceptualize, understand, measure, and map gender and sex, sexual diversity, and sexuality, and also provides unique tools and theories for feminist and queer bioscience, especially within social neuroendocrinology and the studies of testosterone. Dr. Van Anders has received numerous awards for her work in this space and is committed to progressive trans transformation efforts for academic bases and beyond. Thank you all for joining us today, and I will hand it over to Dr. Van Anders to start our panel.
Thank you. It is an honor to be a part of this year's Transgender Day of Visibility with this group and all of you. I want to thank Dr. Loic AJ for suggesting me. Trans people's existences are ever increasingly mobilized as part of aggressive political agendas with the increasing visibilization of trans as target and the increasing invisibilization of trans lives. Trans people continue to push back against this using a broad and impressive array of skills, expertise, and brilliance to work towards global and local spaces where trans people can not only exist, but flourish, and where gender rights are meaningful to us all. Working to make our academic and global landscape a place where trans people can thrive is not just the job of trans folks, though we know that trans people manage and bear the disproportionate brunt of this labor. Cisgender researchers like me are just as implicated in this project, in part because transphobic fires are fueled by cisgender researchers who share our gender trajectories, in part because cisgender researchers do not have to navigate personally directed transphobia, in part because we experience cisgender privilege that means our contributions are less likely to be challenged and more likely to be seen as objective and thus valuable in a scientific cultural frame, in part because we love, respect, and care for our trans colleagues, friends, family members, and loved ones, and in part because liberation from gender prescriptions and prescriptions is all our fight. Yet working in community is key. As always, transgender scholars lead the way in scholarship, thought, and action from and meaningful to trans lives, activism, and advocacy that can change our institutions and practices, making them more welcoming to trans flourishing. So for cisgender scholars, our job is to consider how to be involved in this work and even leadership while amplifying and honoring trans expertise and experts, helping to support the, trans, the work trans people are doing to ensure trans visibility. A key part of this for all of us is to ensure that we make spaces for holding up those who might be sidelined, whether that's cisgender scholars making way for and highlighting trans and or non-binary scholars, as I've mentioned, whether that's academics amplifying the knowledge, expertise, and lived experiences of people from their everyday lives and experiences of oppression, whether that's white trans people forwarding trans people of color or trans settlers helping a focus on two-spirit or multi-spirit indigenous folks. As scholars, we have many roles to play within traditionally valued academic spaces in the larger world. And a key one is working towards epistemic justice or the justice of ensuring our knowledge is produced in ways that are liberatory and not furthering oppression, including who is afforded expertise, how we ask our questions, who is on our research teams and how we report our research. Does our research make space for gender diversity, for gender freedom, for those minoritized on the basis of gender sex, for trans and or non-binary people? Or does it foreclose trans existences and futures? Does the knowledge we create and the ways we create it expand human rights or restrict them? Making visible our academic practices is an important component of working towards change. And our panel today is generously sharing their academic practice, providing valuable views of scholarship that works for and with trans lives, that promotes epistemic justice in the face of sustained transphobic attacks, and that provides models of more just academic involvement that centers transgender people and their con contributions. We can take this moment to remind ourselves that our goal is not just trans visibility, but trans liberation and thriving, and that researchers and scholars, especially trans ones, have made transformative contributions to this, and that we all have profound roles to play in making the world a better place and a place where trans people can flourish. So I'm excited to start our discussion. And the first topic we wanna to discuss is gender equity and trans and or non-binary communities. And I'm gonna start by asking V, given your work on how trans communities of color can mobilize resources from nonprofit organizations and philanthropy, what do trans communities of color need when accessing gender equity funding? Thank you so much, um, Dr. Van Anders for that question and, and for um, Anisha for your and Warren Moira for your organizational labor today. It's really exciting to be a part of this conversation and a happy Trans Visibility Day to everyone here. Um, the, I, I love this question. So I think in um, one thing that comes up over, over and over again in my research with nonprofits and philanthropic organizations are the ways that resources are not just money or they're not just money for maybe the kind of easily identifiable things for trans communities, say healthcare. Um, 
trans funding, trans justice work needs to be focused really holistically on trans lives. And given the ways and the work of misogyny, particularly racialized misogyny, um, and I, my work is based in the US, but we can really think worldwide about this. Um, and there's intersections with class and ability, of course, and many other factors here too. Um, resources and needs really extend um, into the everyday. So I, I work with a lot of very grassroots um, organizations and funders that, that give uh, resources and funding to very grassroots organizations that give small $500 to $2,500 checks, which might be about filling someone's fridge, or it might be about keeping the lights on or paying a particular bill that's due, right? And these are things that might be, um, that might miss um, a lot of kind of larger scale funders that are looking for some broad understanding of gender justice, equity, things like that, um, but they're missing the ways that people sort of everyday lives work. And so when I think about the ways that trans communities of color are accessing resources, I always want to push people to think really capaciously about what those needs and resources might look like and really trusting the voices of trans communities of color to say for themselves, well, what I really need right now is X, Y, Z and giving folks the space to actually name what those needs are and try to work against the kinds of institutional framings that we might have for um, what we think that those needs might look like. So um, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, AJ, can you tell us about the importance of gender equity researchers, including trans and or non-binary communities? I absolutely can. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today and I'm thrilled to be chatting with all of you. Before I dive into that question, I just wanna acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, which is colloquially known as Vancouver, British Columbia. I mean, I think the answer to the question is because trans and non-binary people exist and experience gender-based inequities. And the fact that we are part of the diversity of the human experience means that our issues, our needs need to be considered by researchers. Um, that really it kind of, from my perspective, goes without saying that research ought to be inclusive of the breadth and scope of human existence. And we exist, hi, we're here, we're visible today, but we're visible every day. Um, and so researchers um, ought to be very meaningfully considering our inclusion and our inclusion at all stages of the research project and process. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one interest, something I've often said is like, gaps in our theories are actual people. It's not, it's not theoretical anymore. I mean, this, it's once you get, when you're talking about people that you're choosing to include or exclude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I might circle back to some of you um, about this question with some follow-ups, but I'm gonna go to Mia. Given your advocacy about the importance of trans inclusion in STEM fields, um, can you tell us about the importance of inclusive language, perhaps including its impact on trans-related policy? Yeah, and first of all, again, thanks so much for having me and it's wonderful to have this conversation with all of y'all today. Um, yeah, I guess specifically I want to bring people's attention to a tradition of um, appealing to science on on the right by uh, by actors who are sort of trying to advance anti trans legislation by appealing to some sort of biological intuition that people have. Um, and this approach, uh, you know, we think of as being quite effective because it does speak to sort of simple biology that people learn as, as children and is reinforced through the ways that we interact with uh, gender, both in, with cis and trans people in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, um, what I guess the, the point that I wanna make is that a lot of scientists, uh, especially in biology, have sort of washed our hands of, of having to deal with the nuance here by appealing to a split between gender and sex and saying that, oh, we concern ourselves with some material world of sex and not gender. But of course, um, what's very evident to trans people and our lived experience is that this rhetoric is not sufficient because it sort of canonizes this idea of sex as a material reality that's immutable and, and somehow simple in the ways that, especially people who want to restrict trans people from particular spaces wish it to be. Um, and so I guess what I want to emphasize is that as, as scientists, uh, we have a, a responsibility to communicate and conceptualize sex in, in the complex, non-binary way that it truly is. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. And I often think about the ways that I use the term gender sex quite often because as scientists, especially like when we're studying humans, we actually rarely know whether we're studying gender or sex. And the two, I don't think the two are necessarily completely entangled always, but they're very often so and very rarely are studies aimed at uh, disentangling them or designed to let us know um, to test which is at play. And so keeping in mind that when we're talking about sex, we're also always talking about um, gender and that when we're talking about gender, it's also valuable to think about sex, I think is so important. Um, thank you for that. Sabra, given that your research primarily focuses on trans and non-binary children and adolescents, what does it show about the importance of highlighting the experiences of trans and non-binary youth specifically in the fight for gender equity in healthcare? Yeah, thanks for your question and also for inviting me to be on this panel today. I think in some ways trans and non-binary youth are really at the forefront of the fight for gender equity in healthcare spaces. Um, barriers to accessing gender-affirming care for trans and non-binary youth are present um, at all levels of the social ecological model, right? So lack of caregiver support is one example, um, which is a really critical issue because most trans and non-binary youth need parental consent to receive gender-affirming medical treatment. Barriers such as institutional discrimination um, might might occur, for example, lack of training among healthcare providers to provide affirming care to this population or systems issues related to the ability to include affirmed name, pronouns, and gender identity in electronic medical records. Um, and then we can also think about structural barriers, including the massive influx of legislation that's been proposed and in some, in some cases passed to prevent trans and non-binary youth from from accessing gender affirming medical care. And sort of within this larger group, we can also think about subgroups of trans and non-binary youth who might be um, experiencing unique challenges related to accessing care, such as trans and non-binary youth of color who might be experiencing racism or other forms of social oppression alongside um, cis sexism in healthcare settings, and non-binary youth who might face additional challenges in healthcare spaces because no guidelines exist for gender affirming medical care um, or really any medical care outside of a binary framework of gender and sex. Um, so I think it's really critical that we learn about and make visible the experiences of trans and non-binary youth um, in the healthcare system in, in helping with the, the overall fight for gender equity in healthcare. Thank you. And I've been really struck by how um, a lot of medical spaces instantiate a binary, but then argue that people, um, why can't people explore? Why can't people have time? And it's like that you literally force people into this and then wonder why people are asking to be in one of them. Um, it seems somewhat disingenuous um, for sure. I wanna come back to some of the points that were made. Um, v, when you were talking about mobilizing research resources from nonprofit orgs and philanthropy and trans communities of color and what they need, what are some barriers you see and are promising directions? You sort of talked a little bit about that, but I think we'd like to hear more. Absolutely. So I'll draw on um, an example from one of the organizations that I've worked really closely with over the last sort of five plus years, the Trans Justice Funding Project, which um, provides uh, grassroots grant or grants to grassroots organizations across the United States, including U.S. territories. Um, they provide grants there's within the amounts of twenty five hundred to ten thousand dollars, and they're really sort of looking to get into sort of those those gaps <laughs> in the sort of trans funding world, right? So really getting to the people who um, might be doing meetings out of their living room or out of their um, out of a basement or you know using a tiny little office space that has a bunch of pamphlets that they're distributing to a community that might not other otherwise get access to um, information about gender affirming health care or might not have access to community otherwise or you know movie nights that might be happening um, in a rural area where people don't really see each other in general but certainly not transit or non-conforming communities so those that that's really where that funding is going and a lot of times those applications people are speaking to, you know, the, the, 
they, they can't necessarily appeal to your, your uh, larger funders that might be asking for examples of kind of documented numerical data examples of how are you affecting people's lives. What they can speak to is what it feels like to be trans in their environment and what it feels like to experience transphobia, racism, classism, sexism, misogyny, class in, on, in this environment, right? And they can speak to kind of the, the laws that might be on the books or might be threatening to be on the books in those places that are threatening their lives or they might they can speak to individual experiences. And so um, grant applications in that context for, for GJFP, for the Trans Justice Funding Project, are really focused on kind of getting at those stories, getting at sort of what can you tell us about where it is that you are and what it is that you need. And so those are what sort of the, some of the questions are kind of oriented to. Um, and oftentimes, you know, there's a question that they always have in the application about fundraising challenges. And it's a lack of, you know, labor capacity. People have other jobs. They don't necessarily have the, you know, ability to sit down and write a grant or to sit down and send emails to make a GoFundMe to go around and sort of get that access to money. So um, the the sort of um, question about fundraising challenges gives them the space to speak to that as well. And so um, I think just again, that kind of meeting people where they are and responding to what it is that they say that they're going through and what it is that they say that they need um, is crucial. And another organization that does um, work on a more, on a, a sort of a little bit of a bigger scale or a different scale is the Third Way Fund in New York. Um, and one of the things that they've done that's been really interesting is they've moved away from um, requiring written applications for their grantees. So they, they'll do phone calls, they'll get on, you know, various kinds of, um, various forms of communication just to kind of get people to speak about what it is that they're doing, what it is that they're excited about doing and asking, giving them space to build a vision. Um, because we're often asking people to fit into institutional standards that are, um, you know, that require educational privilege, they require class privilege, they require time as a really important resource. Um, and some of these funders are trying to kind of work differently against that. So um, the barriers are often about those resources and a lack of those resources. And some of those um, funders are trying to kind of respond to those. That's really exciting to think about not only sort of um, uh, the barriers sort of like uh, contextual barriers, but also the barriers that have to do with the very framing of how, uh, what is required to, to get it. So thanks for sharing that. AJ, I wanna come back to um, your discussion about the importance of gender equity researchers, including trans and or non-binary communities. And I guess one thing to think about is like, how do you see gender equity research projects, including trans and or non-binary communities intentionally from the start? I mean, I think the, the honest answer is um, poorly and rarely um, that oftentimes trans and non-binary folks, if they are included, are an afterthought, um, are included in superficial ways that haven't really been thought through. And so we might see recruitment materials that are framed in inclusive ways, but then as a trans or non-binary person, you start to fill out the survey or you start to participate in the interview process and you're instantly met with um, measures of gender, sex, sexuality, et cetera, that are not inclusive. Um, I've seen papers being written where there were trans and non-binary participants, and yet the author of those papers um, called all of the participants women um, because that was their frame and there were participants who were not women within their sample. Um, and so this is, uh, this is violence. Um, so really, I think what we need to do is think through meaningful inclusion from beginning to end, from the conceptualization of product projects through data collection, through uh, dissemination of our findings. And by that, I don't mean if there's 20 authors on your paper, making sure one of them is trans so that you can check a box. Um, who are we giving leadership? Whose voices are we actually prioritizing and privileging within research design? Um, are we designing projects that actually address a community need, or are we replicating problematic research that frames transness as kind of disorder or a problem to be solved? Um, really, this kind of attempt to include trans and non-binary people um, needs to be done holistically, critically, and with precision and care. And we also need to remember that trans and non-binary people are not simply knocking at the doors of cisgender research institutions begging for entry and for permission to be let in, that trans and non-binary people are already doing revolutionary work themselves. 
um, and that cisgender researchers actually have a lot to learn from trans-led research projects, um, from trans scholars who are already making space for themselves within a cis-normative academy that tends to erase and marginalize us, and within the kind of broader research landscape where Erasure begets erasure. The erasure of these communities from the research landscape results in erasure in policy and law and practice and healthcare spaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are already numerous trans and non-binary researchers, hundreds of us, um, doing that work ourselves against the odds. Um, and so, yeah, I would just kind of call any researchers to think meaningfully about who they're recruiting and why, who they're including and why, um, how they're framing projects and topics and problems, um, the interventions they're designing based on that research so that actually we're included through every step and not just as a kind of tokenized afterthought or a check mark on, a, an, on an EDI framework. Yeah, that's so valuable and important for folks to be thinking about. Um, I often see sort of cisgender researchers speculating about a some phenomena related to trans lives. And I think it's so important, I know I've done this and I'm not asking for cookies, but for myself and other cisgender researchers to point out that, oh, there is research on that by trans scholars. Like we don't have to speculate. We don't have to guess, we can read that work and we can hold it up. And I think, um, uh, uh, that's just such an important part of this. I mean, that's a small part of what you said, but a really important part of overall um, the change we need to see. I wanna talk about a different topic um, related obviously, um, but thinking of trans inclusive structural change, which many of you have talked about. Um, and Mia, I'm gonna start with you. From your view as a graduate student, how can um, academic institutions better support trans students specifically? Like what systems and structures need to be changed to advance trans flourishing on university campuses? Just a small question. Right. Yeah. There's where to begin. <laughs> um, I think that you know, as as any trans student would tell you, there's a huge administrative gap in taking care of um, of trans uh, individuals. So just examples of this are names on forms or processes you need to change your names on documents or the names that instructors see when they interact with the canonical online systems for dealing with their courses. All of these areas are places where various administrative choices, either to support the ability of individuals to choose how they are presented to strangers and people who have um, sort of administrative power over them or to not. And what you'll see interacting with these with these structures and certainly something I encountered uh, uh, here at Harvard is that a lot of these systems are designed with, um, with without the, that student, this hypothetical student in mind. They're designed in such a way that um, everything is supposed to collate to some legal legal based um, uh, framework for storing data. Um, and I think that there's there's many steps, many small steps that could be taken for for this to become more inclusive. Um, but I, I sort of highlight this, but I don't want to minimize the impact also of the perspectives of faculty and lecturers and and other administrators at the university. You know, certainly, trans rights and trans inclusion are a hot button issue. That's a no sort of contest. Um, and a natural sort of consequence of this is that at institutions, um, there are naturally conflicts in views between different faculty members, between faculty and students, so on and so forth. And I think universities of, as a whole have taken um, steps to sort of try to appear more neutral with respect to especially the political discourse around um, healthcare for trans youth, trans inclusion, stuff like that. And this is very clearly detrimental. There are certainly, you know, to, to put it bluntly, there are transphobes in the faculty everywhere. And um, requiring trans students to have whisper networks to deal with this is not, you know, it puts an undue burden on these students and, and sort of uh, uh, to what end? You know, all it does is protect the, the sort of political viability of the institution. So. Thank you. Yeah, um, trying to 
portray sort of trans lives and rights as a, you know, a six of one, half dozen of the other, or like, let's take a middle road. Like human rights aren't a middle road kind of thing. And putting students' um, abilities to exist and flourish and, and thrive, um, that's what that sort of rhetoric does is put that at risk. Um, and often to, as you say, to um, really support people whose lives aren't, who, whose lives, you know, this isn't on the backs of them. This isn't a, a burden in that for their lives. Um, so thank you for that. Um, AJ, researchers often focus on cisgender women and gender equity research. And you talked a little bit about this, the way people will name their participants as women, sometimes whether they are or not. Um, so they often focus on cisgender women and gender equity research. And what do you think some of the structural changes um, uh, we need to see to support meaningful and impactful attention to transgender and or non-binary communities in the field? A really great question. And I think we do have really numerous levers at our disposal, but it is um, it is a push that requires the buy-in of folks at different kind of spaces and who uh, serve us in different roles. So if we think about how a research project is conceived and then funded, we have funders, we have ethics review boards, we have um, journals that have peer reviewers and editors. We have faculty who are supervising graduate students. We have all these kinds of folks who are involved and have their eyes and hands on research projects all the way along the system. And if we could implore those individuals to stop exclusionary research in its tracks, um, then there would be more impetus for researchers to design research in inclusive ways because they wouldn't be funded, they wouldn't be published, they wouldn't pass ethics approval. And so really it needs to be a kind of consorted effort where everybody involved in research and everybody involved in kind of the start and stop bureaucratic processes of research would be able to flag a project and say, um, for example, oh, you're interested in studying obstetric violence. Why is your project exclusive to cisgender women? There are trans and non-binary people, intersex and two-spirit people who ought to be included in this project until you um, fix this exclusion we're not going to fund you, we're not going to publish you, this project is not going to receive ethics approval, it's not going to go forward. And really we need that kind of holistic approach to structural change so that inclusion is not the exception to the rule, but actually exclusion needs to be transparently justified. You need to explain to us why it is that you didn't include everybody who ought to be included. Um, and that's the expectation and threshold, as opposed to um, an inclusive study being the exception um, that itself was challenging to fund and challenging to publish, um, because actually the entire system can begin to shift and actually demand meaningfully and thoughtfully inclusive research as the standard. Uh, and really this is about gender equity, but it's also about robust and sound science, uh, that actually our science is going to be better if we are inclusive of, of all people, if we acknowledge the way that oppressive systems impact who we study, what we study, who gets included, who gets invited to the table, um, that ultimately that is to the advantage not only of the populations that we serve, but to like science as this kind of idealized system. Thank you. So, and AJ, that makes me think about, you know, the research infrastructure, because we often think of this as sort of individual, and I think there's definitely room for individual work and change in this. At the same time, we do want to see the research infrastructure and landscape, the, um, the, the, the ways that uh, people's work are valued, and so on. We want to see change there. But I also can think of places where the way that change needs to happen, obviously, as you're saying, needs to be as thoughtful as anywhere else. If it's just, you know, pay attention to sex differences, or if it's um, just include women, you know, that could be in some ways better than not including women, but it just instantiates a whole new um, uh, set of oppressions that um, wouldn't it be better if we thought uh, more capaciously and comprehensively from the start, if it was trans informed, intersex informed, um, uh, understanding the intersections from the get-go so that it wasn't sort of this constant, okay, like given our oppressive culture, let's do this new thing, but without thinking more broadly about how to manage oppression in general. So thank you for that. Um, Sabra, I'm gonna turn to you next. 
Um, what are some of the implications from your research on transgender youth or with transgender youth and families for clinical practice and healthcare institutions? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think my work and, and the work of others in this field has really highlighted how interventions to support trans and non-binary youth um, in accessing gender affirming care really need to occur on all of those different levels and all of those different contexts that I mentioned earlier. Um, thinking about the family context, that's where a lot of my, my research occurs in um, examining the, the family environment and family functioning for trans youth and families. And we really need to have interventions that address lack of caregiver support um, and help caregivers um, understand and learn how to affirm, affirm and support their trans and non-binary youth. If we're thinking about the institutional level um, and discrimination in healthcare, sitting, healthcare settings, we really need to focus on healthcare provider training um, and education on how to provide affirming care to this population. We think about a systems level in, in institutions. Um, we need to update electronic medical forms and intake forms um, to enable the collection of uh, affirm name, pronouns, and gender identity. And those systems need to also carry through all different aspects of care, for example, from front desk interactions to um, clinical visits with clinicians to ID badges and bracelets. We need to think about all of those different areas. And then on a larger structural level, we really need to engage in advocacy to push back on all this legislation um, that's preventing access to care in the first place for this population. Thank you. That all sounds so important. And it, and it obviously dovetails with what Mia was talking about with electronic records. There's sort of this legalistic framing in a lot of these spaces um, that may have worked for some people at some time, but clearly isn't working for people. And, and the rationale for it is has, has never really been clear in a lot of ways. Um, so that's just to, to think about one of the things you said. V, you've worked with gender equity nonprofit and philanthropy organizations who are working on becoming trans inclusive and trans affirming in their work. How can gender equity departments and organizations that exist within academic and research institutions become more trans inclusive and affirming? Like how might some of what you've learned um, travel? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of practical considerations that uh, my co-panelists have really brilliantly laid out um, where there's kind of the, the idea that gender is not a binary, um, which is simple for many of us, but complicated in practice. Um, it's sort of working with that uh, in terms of education, in terms of actually kind of looking at forms, looking at records, looking at all of those different layers, I think it becomes really crucial. Um, I think there's also the kind of messy work of inclusion and affirmation in actual practice too, um, with things like you know job application hire. So one of the things that I've worked on with nonprofit organizations is talking about when you're doing a search for um, say a new executive director for your organization or so for, for some, um, you know, any kind of job position and thinking about what are the requirements that you've laid out and who's going to be automatically excluded from the ways that those requirements are framed. Um, one of the things that's been really important in a lot of nonprofit contexts is changing the sort of expectation of a bachelor's degree or a college degree um, and changing that to sort of like relevant experience um, because many community members are very, very qualified to work in nonprofit organizations um, from their work of just organizing with communities um, and not from getting a bachelor's degree in say sort of social work or sociology or whatever it may be. Um, so I think that's a huge piece of it in, in addition to what my co-panelists have already said. Another thing that I think is really important that I think a lot about um, with my students is when we think about what gender is and what we're talking about with gender, um, it's a term in a, in a category that has a very um, racist, classist, ableist history, right? Understandings of gender in science and psychology and medicine have been tied to histories of the transatlantic slave trade, to histories of colonization. And so any understanding that we have of gender and gender equity has to be um, intersectional. It has to include the 
the ways that we understand racism and classism, um, misogyny, all of these things together. And so um, I, I'm always pushing for kind of a really, a way in which trans justice work um, and trans inclusion work thinks about all of those things. And I think similarly, gender equity can't just be about saying, you know, um, like what folks have already pointed to, not just, you know, we included women in the study or we, um, we didn't just assume male as the human. Um, instead, really thinking critically about what it is that gender means to individual participants in a study or, you know, what gender means to individual people who might walk into the door of an academic or research institution, um, whether it's to work or to, um, or to be a research subject or whatever it may be. Um, it's thinking about sort of this complicated ways that, that there's no one way that gender plays a role in people's lives. And so gender equity is really a project about broader equity for, for all people. Um, and, and trans gives us a really beautiful, productive way to kind of think about that, um, but it doesn't necessarily land for all people either. So just thinking really critically about how gender works um, and these complicated histories of it. So it's a, it's a sort of, um, a balance between doing that work of saying, okay, these are pronouns, these are ways to be trans inclusive, and also recognizing how much difference there is across gender, you know, in, within the United States alone, but certainly transnationally, cross-culturally, et cetera. Yeah, that is so helpful and important for us to be thinking about. You know, people often talk about race ethnicity. It's not a descriptive project, it's a regulatory project or a project that was created to sort of uh, give names and rationales to already existing hier power hierarchies and to do with colonization, to do with settler colonialism and, and so on. And um, we could think about gender in that way too, not as simply descriptive, right? But And obviously there's a long history of um, people doing that, but um, understanding that gender has that, uh, what is gender there for? What is it to do? What are people using it for and how are they deploying it? And how are they doing that in ways that also have racializing um, impacts, uh, colonizing impacts and so on um, that are connected to those in more, you know, not just one or the other, but deeply interconnected ways. Sabra, I wanna come back um, to you and ask you about leaders. So you've talked about healthcare organizations, but what about leaders in, in healthcare settings, in medical settings and so on? How can they better support trans and or non-binary youth in accessing gender affirming care? What can they do um, specifically? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the buy-in from leadership is so crucial to this advocacy work and ensuring that it actually happens and moves forward. And that can sometimes be as simple as, you know, a statement on the part of the leadership um, about the importance of this area, or, you know, we as an organization support trans, um, trans and non-binary youth and um, are, are against all of this legislation that, that restricts access to care. I think it can also come in the form of resources. You know, um, if there are certain people within an institution who are working on these advocacy efforts, ensuring that there is protected time for those individuals, that there are, are funding and resources allocated to, to making the changes that need to be made in those spaces, um, such as updating, updating the electronic medical record, right? It's um, in practice, it, it turns out to be very complicated in some situations to actually make those changes and make it happen. And it and it requires a lot of work. And so there needs to be, you know, resources and, and time allocated to make that happen. So leaders can kind of put their money where their mouths are, their, you know, course releases or time, protected time where their mouth is to make sure that people are resourced to do the work um, exactly. that uh, they would like to. So it's one thing to sort of say the right things, but to make sure they're actually actionable makes a big difference. Exactly. So we have just two minutes before we open up to the general Q&A, but I wanted to check with all of you if anyone had a follow-up point to something they said or something about um, that was sparked from someone else. I was thinking a little bit about something, I can't remember who said it earlier about, I think it was, it was Sari maybe, about um, just acknowledging that there's so much work that's been done out there by by trans academics in in research spaces and just to also say if, if it's an area where that work hasn't been done by by trans people for whatever structural barrier reason um, engaging the community in other ways can also 
be an important way to make sure that those voices come into the research and work um, and, and sort of balance out the, the cisgender led uh, research projects that are out there, mine Thank included. You. Thank you. Yeah. And I think when I think about what V was saying, like, you know, just because it's not, well, you didn't say this exactly, V, but I'm thinking like, just because it's not in the academic literature doesn't mean it's not out there either, because there's so many forms of writing and um, speech and uh, knowledge out there that, you know, academics is one place we can turn to and we should be and you're right. And then also thinking more broadly too, because who has access to academic spaces is quite restricted and, and therefore we can restrict what we're sharing if we only turn to academic knowledge for uh, especially for people in marginalized groups and social positions. I see AJ's hand. Yeah, just building on what Saber was saying about, you know, leadership putting their money where their mouth is, as it were, I'm seeing a shift towards institutions updating their missions and value statements to kind of indicate that they value inclusive, inclusive, uh, like EDI frameworks and principles, um, even stated principles of gender equity. And I see also shifts towards the diversification of student populations, med students, um, research teams, that kind of thing. But ultimately, that is only ever going to be lip service unless an institution has done the work of creating safer spaces for these individuals within the institution. Otherwise, we're just inviting marginalized people into the lion's den um, and inviting them to be exposed to violence while the institution gets to say, but we value equity. And so ultimately, we need those leaders. We need um, we need folks to be able to learn how to operationalize their values. Um, what does it actually mean to create an inclusive workspace, to create an inclusive research team, to a, create an inclusive research project? Um, because I think a lot of folks might value gender inclusivity, might value gender equity, but don't actually know how to put that into practice. And so we need to provide folks with the language, skills, competencies, confidence um, to be able to do that, or else we risk further marginalizing marginalized people by inviting them to into a system that's only going to cause them harm. Thank you. And I also think about even the, the language you might use, like welcoming in, inviting in, that sounds really positive in some ways, but it makes clear who's, you know, if, if it's your house, you invite people into it. It's not our house. It's not our space. And I think even the way we frame it can be really uh, indicative and can help us think, okay, like, is this my house? I'm inviting someone in. And sometimes that might be the case, but let's be thoughtful about that. And if I want this to be our house, well, what does that mean? That's a very different kind of conversation. Yeah. So I'm going to turn to some of the questions um, and I'm going to pick a little bit randomly. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Elaine Zundel, and you can let me know. I hope I'm pronouncing names right. I care so much about name pronunciations because mine is always wrong. Um, I really appreciate your point about designing research that is more inclusive. I've encountered bureaucratic structures that require more documentation or justification to include trans and or non-binary folks in a study. I think this comes from the assumption that trans and or non-binary folks are more vulnerable populations. Should we push back against this? Who would like to go first, um, Mia or V? Because I think we just heard from AJ and Sabra. Sure, I'd be happy to comment on this. Um, yeah, I think this is like an interesting tension, right? Between trying to minimize friction for studying certain populations and trying to make sure that the research done on them is productive and, and nonviolent, honestly. Um, and I think a good example of, of where, you know, how we can think about this tension is in things like um, genetic association studies for um, marginalized identities. So this would be like a, a sexual attraction GWAS or something uh, of that nature. Um, and there's a lot of discourse about studies like this for good reason, because there's, uh, you know, arguments between is all science worth doing? Should we, shouldn't we study these populations versus you know, there are real material uh, consequences to putting this information out there, if it's even scientifically valid. Um, and I think the important distinction, in my opinion, is differentiating between including individuals in a sample for a study that studies some disjoint phenomenon, like you would want to include trans people in something studying um, aspirin effectiveness, just in so, sort of a vague sense, versus a study that is looking at, say, is hormone therapy causal for some medical, you know, medicalized uh, uh, phenomenon? These are very different 
um, ways of approaching trans populations. And I think it's appropriate that we have different standards for these sorts of things. So I hear you saying, first of all, there's not sort of like a one size fits all. It's not like trans inclusion looks the same for every type of research question. And there might be times where we need to attend to, I mean, we always want to attend to specificities and vulnerabilities, but there might be times where um, the stakes are different. For sure, thank you. Um, does anyone else have a quick add on thought to that before I move on to another question? I can just add on from, from sort of the, the youth perspective that you know, youth and research already require extra protections within a, a research ethics framework. And I think trans and non-binary youth in some ways do require extra protections beyond that. Um, if we're thinking about how there's a lot of rejection in family contexts and um, some trans and non-binary youth might not even be out in their families. So requiring things like parental consent is not always appropriate um, in research with that population. But I think at the same time, we also have to have a balanced view and not expect that all trans and non-binary youth in a given study are going to have negative outcomes. And we need to make sure that we're also focusing on strengths and resilience um, and you know, having a holistic, holistic view of these um, of these participants. And to some extent, it's also like maybe an empirical question. I mean, not that we want to test out how harmful research is per se, but I know sex research, which is also one of my homes, has done a fair bit of work. Um, there were assumptions that asking about sex was always harmful um, and had certain kinds of harms. And people did a lot of research to see, well, what kinds of harms are they? Um, when do they exist? When don't they? How do they compare to harms from other kinds of research? And we might take that approach that, um, you know, there can be harms just as there can be with anything. And what do they look like? How do they change over time? How do they depend on the group we're um, working with and so on? So thank you for that. I'm going to go to another question, which is AJ was talking about visibility earlier. And I wonder why gender researchers talk very sparsely about ethical visibility and inclusion. For example, a team working on the sexualities of Greek heroes um, has, uh, sorry, things are popping up, has, um, trans and or non-binary members, but what is the point of including them if their opinions are relegated to the footnotes? So there's a lot there. Um, any thoughts? I'm happy to start us off. And I mean, I think the fact that we have a, a thing called Trans Day of Visibility speaks to a way that visibility is often valorized um, without thinking about the potential risks of visibility, that to be visible comes with inherent vulnerabilities and exposing oneself to the potential of discrimination and violence on the basis of that visibility. So I think visibility has become kind of like a buzzword in a lot of ways where folks are interested in making visible or rendering visible as though they coming from a cis perspective are the ones tasked with making other people visible in a kind of like patronizing savior like way. Um, but that actually like visibility enough it, it alone is never going to be enough um, that rendering people visible. Um, while exposing them to being relegated to a footnote, as this question asker has phrased it, is actually not only insufficient, but potentially more harmful than invisibility. Um, and that we need to make sure again, that like, we're not just including trans and non-binary people in order to check a box, in order to satisfy some kind of EDI framework, in order to kind of um, be performative in our allyship, um, that actually, if we're putting trans authors on our studies, that we need to make sure we're also insulating them from the harms of cis normativity and violent transphobia within the institutions that they work within. Um, because ultimately to be a trans scholar is to be precarious and marginalized within cis normative institutions. Um, and our visibility actually comes at the, the expense of our careers a lot of the time. Um, and so, yeah, that's, those are my disjointed thoughts on the question. That's really helpful to think about. Earlier, we had been talking about some possible anecdotes um, uh, about, about this. And, and I was thinking about how like one conference I had been to um, is not a place where trans folks often feel safe and can go. And so when there was like a transphobic um, event going on, like it wasn't really a place for 
for trans folk, like to expect that trans folks could go in and speak to it. And some might and some might not, but it was a place like, okay, how can cisgender people make the transphobia visible given that it's, it can still have costs for us, but it's not gonna be, you know, the costs are just so different. The stakes are so different because the transphobia isn't directed at us. Um, so thinking about visibility, I think, I keep saying this word just, I love the sound of it, but like capaciously, like thinking about it, as, as um, where can it happen, where can't it, why can't it happen, how and who is, is responsible for trying to increase its plausibility and possibility and actuality. Thank you. Um, Sharik uh, Faruqi uh, has a question, and again, I hope I'm pronouncing names right. Um, in transnational spaces, how can we amplify and increase transgender-led research with communities where they have no access to academia or where it is incredibly culturally stigmatized? For example, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America. And I'd also like to say, like, we sometimes hold up um, these places, but we can also think of huge swaths of Canada and the U.S. where we also um, can say that. But I also get we're trying to move away from the global north or, or west or so on and think about the global south. Who might jump into that? I guess I, this might be an um, unsatisfying answer. So someone else can feel free to um, add to it. But I think in adding on to what you had just said um, about, you know, sort of lack of access to knowledge that's affirming of trans identities or that sort of allows, gives trans folks, you know, language for their experiences or that really um, is sort of trans affirming. Um, that lack of access is a, really a global issue. It's one that it's, it's of course in the global South, maybe we assume it's concentrated there, but in the US and, and Canada, there's definitely ways in which that, that's missing. And I think it really has to do, uh, one answer that's really, that I think, might be productive, um, is thinking really, again, capaciously about um, what knowledge looks like and how and where we find it. So um, there's different understandings of gender in different parts of the world. So you might find, you know, access to kind of trans or gender non-conforming communities, not through the language of trans, but through the language that's really specific to that cultural context. So I think looking to, um, you know, community members to actually speak to what are, what is your understanding of gender and where does it sort of matter for you in your life, right? Sometimes it's religious, sometimes it's cultural, sometimes it's um, legal, sometimes it's, it's irrelevant except for to fill out a grant application for USAID funding, right? Sometimes, so there's a really, um, I think just thinking about how local knowledges are being produced um, and going from there because it's not necessarily going to be produced even in the sort of academy in those spaces either. Um, it might be coming from community-based organizations. It might be just coming from word of mouth um, and sort of communal living in life. So um, just understanding that gender and gender equity as a project is something that's never going to always look one way, particularly when we look outside of a Western or Global North context. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I think really understanding that these are um, experiences, existences, political identities, there's, uh, they don't translate, they don't transliterate necessarily, and like, making sure we understand, like, what, what um, are we trying to, interested in trying to understand and making sure that uh, how we go about that is, is rooted in local lives and experiences and so on, and not uh, like a Western frame or a um, global north frame that is like sort of uh, implant uh, carried wholesale somewhere. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, Gabrielle Ramirez, what's uh, asks? What's one of your favorite success stories from these efforts? Mia, do you have one? You look like you're thinking of one? Uh, I, guess, I guess, you know, success story is a quite a strong term in a way, especially when so many of these, these things are characterized as ongoing projects. Um, but uh, I guess like, you know, I think there are ways that we can be optimistic looking at, at, the, at the sort of uh, uh, progress of structures around us and and I think, you know, to touch on something that a lot of people have brought up, the ways that people think about including people in research projects have changed tremendously, even in very recent history. And I think that that's, um, well, not, you know, not a concerted effort per se, is um, a really good sign for 
for and a hopeful sign for science in the future. Thank you. Anyone else have a quickish one? I can give a, a quick one. Um, I as as a research supervisor, supervise a lot of trans and non-binary trainees um, in different capacities as students and, um, and research assistants. And for this feels in some ways like a small success, but when I see the use of correct pronouns from other people at the institution, when they're emailing me about those trainees or um, you know talking about them in other contexts, that feels like a success to me because I spend so much time correcting people and um, and advocating for the people I work with to, to be using the correct name and pronouns. And when it's, when it's done, it feels really good. Thank you. AJ or V, anything really quick? I guess I, I've seen really beautiful examples of how, you know, in the world of the sort of grassroots funding realm that I was speaking to, where that kind of, you know, thousand dollar check, five hundred dollar check can really end up sort of making a huge difference in people's lives. And one example that comes to mind is I think it was a maybe twenty five hundred dollar check that came through a giving circle through one funder, one funder um, that ended up allowing um, a, a black trans woman to build a fundraising platform through which she was able to actually fundraise millions of dollars um, to house uh, black trans women in New York City. So there's been ways in which sort of the small amount of money you might think, OK, it's going to get thrown in one resource or something like that actually has the potential to really make a huge difference. So um, that's a success story that comes to mind for in my work. Well, I want to thank you all so much for your thoughts and insights and brilliance in the today and all the work you've done up to today, um, V, AJ, Sabra, and Nia. And I want to thank Anisha for the amazing organization. And I want to thank all of you for coming out and um, wish you, uh, those of you who are trans and are non-binary, a happy trans day of visibility. Thank you so much. <laughs>